Well, good morning again there, uh, Hillman Baptist Church. Hope, ev- hope everybody's well this morning and doing well. I bring you greetings from my lovely wife who's unable to be here this morning. She does not have COVID, okay? Just, let me just settle that right now in the event there's a rumor. <clears throat> but she is um, she's just not feeling well. She's got some kind of bronchitis or sinus allergy thing, you know, and so that happens, and uh, she um, felt it'd be best not to take and to come and uh, share all of that with you, so I think you understand. Um, Okay, let's get a couple of things out of the way first, all right? Right off. How many of you went deer hunting yesterday? Keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Okay, if you got a deer yesterday, keep your hands up. Uh, That warms my heart, amen. That's... uh, (laughs) Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you, man. I'm telling you, I uh, I did a I had a wonderful time of getting lots of fresh air, is what it is, and uh, yeah, I saw three squirrels, and that was it, man. Honestly, uh, just three squirrels, yeah, and that was it. Uh, but anyway, that was all good. And glad uh, I'm glad none of you got one. So anyway, all that to say, <laughs> teasing, teasing. I I hope you do better in the following week. All good. Um, We're going to look today in uh, Psalm 70. So if you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of Psalms, and we're going to look in Psalm 70 and uh, and go from there this morning. Um, And as you're turning, let me just say this. Um, Thank you very much for the opportunity to come and to preach the word to you. Uh, I mean that sincerely. I... uh, it encouraged, I probably, the invitation and this opportunity uh, probably encourages me, I hope, I, I know it does, and I hope uh, you get some encouragement out of it. I hope, they don't, I hope you don't leave and say, man, I, when are we getting him back? I hope never, you know. I hope you don't say that when you leave. Um, so anyway, I said all that to say it encourages me. Um, uh, being as the chaplain, we've had no church services at the prison for the last 18 months, and so there's been nothing there, and um, that is my big outlet on Sunday morning. I preach there, and so I haven't been able to do that, and uh, when you're called to do this, there's this call inside of you that, you know, just wants to get released, and um, Hopefully I won't hurt you this morning, okay? I promise. Uh, I, I will do my best to refrain. Uh, I was trained in the South, and uh, anyway, they're pretty wild and woolly down there, and I've learned to temper that a little bit, being uh, here in Minnesota, you know, with you wonderful, wonderful folks. <clears throat> Look with me, if you will, this morning. Psalm 70, and uh, just before we read this, let me give you just a little bit of history and Hopefully that will help you as we read it. Understand this. The book of Psalms, primarily out of 150 Psalms, if you're going to uh, take and ask, okay, what's really the central teaching going on in the Psalms? You're going to find two main predominant teachings. You'll see a number of other things, but two primarily. One is this. In life, there's going to be struggles. There's just struggles in life. That's just the way it is. There's going to be trials. There's going to be opposition. There's going to be troubles. Welcome to Life 101. The second big teaching that's found in the Psalms is this. And it actually spins off of the first one. Yes, in life there are troubles, but big truth number two, God is bigger than all of our troubles. You know, and he's planning, or his plan is, He stays with us. He loves us. He guides us. He helps us through all of that. And oftentimes those struggle, those uh, struggles, those troubles and struggles are are designed to do really this. It's designed to point us to him. It's designed to get our attention so that uh, because we get really easily out of focus, you know, things down here tend to take our attention and God allows those things to happen to point us back to him. Um, the other thing is this that's found and if you were to again if you were to take our struggles and trials and all those things and if you took all the psalms and put all the psalms if you will 
into, if we could convert them into some kind of liquid and put them into something, some nice little jar and shake it up and condense it down and keep condensing it and so on, and encapsulate it, you would come up with Psalm 70. This is kind of like the, really the theme of all the Psalms put in five verses. Because really, if you think about it, most of our struggles and troubles, the opposition that we have in life it's really through people. It's our struggles with other people. If you think about it, other things that happen, uh, the garage door breaks, the refrigerator quits working, your printer all of a sudden dies when you need one. <clears throat> this is old school. Dude, I haven't had to write a sermon in I don't even know how long. I didn't print it. I was like, what's this called? Oh, an ink pen, yeah. <clears throat> uh, but... Our, those things happen, and what do you do? Okay, well, the furnace breaks, so you call the repairman. The refrigerator goes out, so you try to find another one. And the car breaks, and you, either you try to fix it or... You see what I'm saying? We fix those things. It's not that always so easy to fix relationships. It's not always easy to take and to get those things back where they're supposed to be. It's, I mean, uh, we're pretty idealistic and thinking, oh, yeah, that's a simple thing. You know, God has... Basically, two formulas, if you will. One, and this is for believers, when it comes to having our opposition by way of people, uh, God says, pray for your enemies. Pray for them. When it comes, the second formula is this. You have struggles with other believers. I know that never happens to anybody here at Hillman Baptist Church, but just... In the, in the small possibility that there's some other brother out there that maybe you've had a little bit of tension with, <clears throat> God has another formula for that. And it's basically this. <clears throat> Be reconciled to your brother. That takes some courage. That's what it does. With all those things in mind, let's look in Psalm 70 and starting in verse number one. I'm reading from the King James Version, so... Uh, bear with me. In verse number one, he says, Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Let them be ashamed and confounded that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and put to confusion that desire my hurt. Verse three, let them be turned back for a reward of shame that say, Aha, aha. Verse number four, let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee, and let such as love thy salvation say continually, let God be magnified. But I am poor and needy. Make haste unto me, O God. Thou art my help and my deliverer. O Lord, O Lord, make no tarrying. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord God, thank you for being such a good God to us. Thank you that you hear. And Lord God, thank you that you answer prayer. Lord God, thank you that these dear folks, they could have been anywhere this morning. They chose to be here, and I pray you would bless them for that. I pray, Father, that just the reading of your word and the prayer and, and maybe something this morning would take and encourage them. Lord, there are folks here that have some um, deep hurts. They're going through some things right now, and I pray that you would be with them. Lord, there are other folks that are even... They're, they may be even coming out of something, a deep hurt. And Lord, there's other folks, they're going to be in a deep hurt and they don't even know it yet. So I pray that you would bless. I pray that, Lord God, you would encourage and guide and direct. And I pray, Father, that truly your richest blessings might take and rest upon us this morning. Father, I do ask that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God, I pray you'd have great liberty to move through the audience, touch hearts, and change lives, Lord God, as it seems good for you to do. And we'll thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> as we take a look here in Psalm number 70, uh, there's a couple of, there's some similarities in this, ver in this passage that we just want to take a look at. And then we're going to take and dive into our sermon uh, this morning. If you notice in verse number one, he says, Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Now, this psalm is a lot like many psalms. They begin and end the same, okay? So now look down at verse 5. He says, but I am poor and needy. And here he goes, make haste unto me, O God. Thou art my help and my deliverer. O Lord, make no tarrying. Um, it just 
by way of introduction and so uh, here, understand something. Um, the psalmist, what he's crying for is immediate deliverance. He says, dear God, make haste. I need your help and I need it right now. <clears throat> Uh, that's pretty much the way we are in life, isn't it? I mean, we get into something, it's like, okay, God, I don't need you to wait on this one. Uh, I could use your help and, uh, you know, 10 minutes ago would have been better than 10 minutes from now. I mean, that's just the way it is. And let me help you with two truths. Sometimes God does deliver that way. Sometimes he does. There's a movie, um, it's, a, it's a bit older now, that I would uh, challenge you if you could find it uh, and watch it. It's called Faith Like Potatoes. Okay, so you've seen it. One of the wonderful things I enjoy about the movie is uh, the gentleman that the uh, story surrounds. I want to say his first name is Angus. Don't, I'll stand correct. Am I right on that? Those of you who have much better memory than I do. <clears throat> what I, uh, the one part that I remember is there was this fire and they're out there, and what they didn't want was that fire to spread to their neighbors and just get totally out of hand. So he stops and he prays that God would take and send a storm, and a storm all of a sudden comes up and drenches, you know, that fire, fire is put out. God brought immediate deliverance. That's awesome. I mean, sometimes those things happen. But let me help you also, sometimes God doesn't do that, and he's still God. He's still God. Uh, the story of John Bundyan. Here he was in prison for preaching while he was, uh, while he was uh, in England, and he stayed in prison for 12 years. There were multiple times he could have gotten out if he just said, well, no, I won't preach anymore. But he said, no, I cannot say that. His faith was just determined to take and to, to serve God. The other thing was this. Other people tried to get him out of prison. Uh, there was a gentleman at that time who was quite the uh, influence. His name was William Wilberforce. Mr. Wilberforce was a, was a force to be reckoned with in those days. He was quite the political figure as well as a, a very, very staunch believer. He tried to get John Bunyan out of prison to absolutely no avail. But think of this. In the 12 years while John Bunyan stayed in prison, he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress is the second largest publicized story in the history of our day. Do you realize the only book that's ever taken and surpassed it as far as publication is the Bible? The only one. It's just absolutely amazing. Well, the point I'm trying to make is this. <clears throat> we pray for God's deliverance and dear God, really love for you to show up right now. And sometimes he does, but understand sometimes he doesn't. That's, uh, and it doesn't mean that he's any less God, how he chooses to take and to operate in those situations. He does say, call unto me and I'll answer thee. We had a lady in our church when I was in, uh, when we lived in Florida, I'll never forget this. She prayed for her husband for 54 years that he would get saved. And after 54 years, he came to know Christ as his savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm just simply saying, listen, uh, we want immediate deliverance, but God knows what, but God has a much better plan. He's got a bigger picture in mind as to how all those things happen. <clears throat> Second thing also, if you notice here, and this is really a testimony to the psalmist. He not only wants immediate deliverance, but notice also he is asking for merciful retribution on the part of those who oppose him. Look in verse 2. He says, let them be ashamed and confounded that seek after my soul. He said, let them be turned backward and put to confusion that desire my hurt. Let them be turned back for, for a reward of shame that say, aha, aha. Listen, his request, it seems like he's more merciful to his enemies than his enemies are to him. Because notice, he's only asking them, he's asking God. He said, put them, put them to confusion. Just have them turn back. But he also says this, he said, these are people, he said, that are after my soul. These are people that, disease, that seek my hurt. Do you understand? From their perspective, maybe they just wanted to get rid of David. But from his perspective, he's saying, listen, I, I understand these people can't, they don't know the God that I know. Are you with me? And he's praying in a merciful way toward his opposers, not in an unmerciful way. <clears throat> uh, 
you know, uh, the Bible does say, pray for them which despitefully use you. And also says this, if you're asked to go a mile, go with them too. Go with them too. That's completely different than our way of thinking, is it not? Our human nature desires to see just retribution to those that we call our enemies. <clears throat> um, I don't know about you, but there are times I've wanted to take and, you know, pray, say, dear God, <clears throat> If you're looking for somebody to zap with a lightning bolt, I've got a short list right here. <clears throat> and I've even taken the time to take and to put them in order as to which one is really more deserving than the other ones. <clears throat> so uh, like uh, person number one, they probably could use two good zaps with a lightning bolt and a third probably wouldn't hurt them, just to be honest with you, you know. <clears throat> the second one, two will work. And the third one... Let's move him up to number one as I'm thinking about something. We, we want it to be just. You know what I'm saying? We want it like an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And that's what we want. But that's not the way God works. That's not his economy. Do you understand that? Remember when the, there's a story and it's uh, there in the, in the Gospels where the apostles, they had taken and gone out and they said, and when they came back, they said, hey, this, uh, this particular city didn't receive us. Shouldn't we just call down heaven on them? Let's burn them all up, just like Elijah did? I love the response of Jesus, because he said, you don't know what spirit you're of, do you? You understand? Here were the guys that walked with the Son of God, and they didn't get it. He's, that's not his first recourse. His first recourse is not lightning bolt on him or hit him with a baseball bat. That's not the way God works. His first reaction, think about this. If God is love, then everything that emanates from him comes from that character trait. Everything, every decision, every trial that takes and affects you, every trouble, every flat tire, every broken air conditioner, every thing that happens is filtered through a God of love. Every little thing. We read, there's a verse that oftentimes, you know, Christians, when we read it, we say, yeah, that's what that means. It's in the book of Proverbs, and it says if your enemy hungers and, you know, you should feed him, and, and so on. By that, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Pause. When we first read that, we say, boy, I like that part. If I do nice to him, God has a way of getting them back. That's what we're thinking, because that's our culture, is it not? But in the culture that this, this wonderful book here was written, it's quite the opposite. To take and to heap coals of fire on somebody was to be a blessing to them. Understand, in their day, their culture was very much agricultural and so on. They had to go out to work and, you know, out in the fields and, they didn't have electricity or running water. So what did they have to do in order to keep the house taken and keep it warm and keep everything going? They had to have a fire going. So maybe they were out working in the field for 10 or 12 hours and they get back and their fire is out. And so what they would do is if somebody they're in a bad way, let's just say a storm came up and they had to get a fire going in order for their to stay healthy and warm, they'd go to their neighbor and say, hey, can you give me some coals of fire? And in their culture, what they did is they would put that coals of fire in this little pan and the woman would wear it on top of her head in this pan, thereby warming her body, heaping coals of fire on their head was a blessing. It was not taken and saying, <laughs> oh yeah, if I'm nice to you, uh-huh, I know how you're going, this is going to work out, all in my favor, yeah, that's not the motive, you understand, that's not the motive, <clears throat> listen, we have a wonderful God, a wonderful God, and as we do have trials and tribulation, listen, let's have some merciful retribution, you know, when it comes to uh, our situations in life, not only immediate deliverance and merciful retribution, but notice verse four. This is kind of, if you will, the hinge pin for the entire verse. He says in verse four, let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, let God be magnified. Here, the psalmist, he's praying for like-minded brethren to enjoy the God of salvation, just to take an and to enjoy God. 
Now think with me just for a second. Why shouldn't believers be happy in Christ? I mean, the word, if you notice here, I want you to see this. Uh, the word, he says, let all those that seek thee rejoice. In Hebrew, <clears throat> that word is talking about inward rejoicing, inward gladness, if you will. And then the next word, and be glad in thee, the word glad, the second time, different Hebrew word that means to be expressive outward. So it starts inside, it gets shown outside. Somebody say amen, that's pretty good stuff right there. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Listen, why shouldn't believers be happy? Well, think about it, God, our dear God, he's given us all things to enjoy. Also this, he's assured us of our eternal home. He's promised to, never, to always uh, protect us, to provide for us, to lead us, give us wisdom if we ask for it. He's given us the Holy Spirit as a down payment of our future glory with him. And he's also promised to fill us with the Holy Spirit if we just ask. Man, we've got it made and don't know it. Amen. That's good preaching, Brother Mike. <clears throat> I'm just simply saying, listen, when it comes time, as things are taken and maybe you have opposition and so on, don't forget that you have brethren somewhere else that are probably going through the same thing. I didn't realize that today is that International Prayer Day for persecuted believers. We have it so easy in America. We have it so easy. Um, I do wonder, and our, think about this, I'm not going to get off on any political tangent, but understand this, our our freedoms are slowly eroding. It's not fast. It's slowly ero eroding. I wonder how it will be for my grandchildren and just the opposition that they're going to face. Right now, we've got it pretty doggone good. Pretty good. But there will come a day. I am just convinced of it, just the way it's going to be. Listen, learn to pray for like-minded brethren to enjoy the God of salvation. Um, one more little thing in reference to this. The apostles, when they saw they were out and about and they came back to report to Jesus, they made this, they made this uh, observation. They said, Lord, we saw a guy over there. He was casting out demons in your name and we forbid him because he's not in our little group. To which Jesus said, forbid him not. Forbid him not. Can I put it into our vernacular? Leave them alone. Just leave them alone. Listen, if God wants to stop them, don't you think he's big enough to do that? <laughs> I mean, seriously? I mean, or do you think, you know, you have to defend God? Seriously? We have to defend him. I think he's big enough to take care of himself, just to be quite honest about it. I'm not saying we shouldn't take a stand for truth. I'm not, you know, I'm not dismissing that. I'm simply saying this. There are some people just, you may not agree with how they do their church. Leave them alone. Just you do your thing. Uh, there's a great statement in the prison. If there's anything great, here's a, here it is. And that is this. You ask a guy, how you doing? He said, I'm staying in my lane, chaplain. That means this. He's minding his own business. What that guy does, that's his business. Man, what a great thing if Baptist churches learn to practice that little bit of truth. I'm telling you what. Yeah, stay in your lane. Just stay in your lane. Do your thing, all right? Whatever happens over there, that happens over there. You do your thing. Amen. This is good preaching. Hallelujah. <laughs> <clears throat> Last of all, take a look with me in verse number, number five. He says, but I'm poor and needy. Now, let me help you with something here. Just by way of explanation, when he says he's poor and needy, this is king David, who's writing this, all right? King David was not broke, all right? He wasn't on the edge of financial ruin, uh, not at all. As a matter of fact, if you study the, if you study prior to his death, he got, he had resources available so that Solomon could build the temple because he was not allowed to, all right? If we were to calculate that by today's standard, it would most likely be in the millions and millions of dollars. He was not broke. When he says, I am poor and needy, here's really what he's going to remember. This is a psalm, and much of it in here is poetic. Like, aha, aha. That's a mock. It's mocking the person. 
It's mockery in a poetic way. Saying he's poor and needy is also just using figurative language to say this. Man, without God, I'm bankrupt. Without God, I'm just totally bankrupt. I got nothing. Does it matter if I have all these resources without him? Man, I'm pretty poor and needy. And that's why he takes and says, make haste unto me, O God. He says, thou art my help and my deliverer. O Lord, make no tarrying till I come. Let me give you just a handful of things here. And then we're going to wrap this up. Some takeaways. Number one, listen, learn to ask God for relief from your adversaries, not for their demise. When you have opposition, it's okay. All right? It's okay if you take and ask God, hurry up. I'm, I'm sure he's heard that before, just to let you know. <clears throat> My guess is I wonder how many times that prayer was offered yesterday morning, you know, as people are sitting in their tree stands. Just wondering, just wondering, you know. <clears throat> I, can, I know at least a number of us, it wasn't answered, but that's the way it is. Anyway, listen, learn to ask God for relief from your adversaries, but don't pray for their demise. There's a, in the New Testament, it says when you pray, it says to do so without wrath. Understand? Without wrath. <clears throat> As we said, listen, there's a different formula if your opposer happens to be your brethren. It's, it's simply this. First, be reconciled. First, be reconciled. And I think God understands there's sometimes things can't be reconciled. But I think the attempt needs to be made. And it takes courage to take and to confront somebody when, there's a, when there is an issue. It takes courage to do that. <clears throat> it takes courage to be a believer. So learn to ask God for relief from your adversaries, not for their demise. Number two, find your satisfaction and fulfillment in the finished work of Christ. I love that verse, verse four. Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such, let such, uh, and let such as love thy salvation say continually, let God be magnified. Listen, again, to back this up with a supporting verse, it says, in him we live and move and have our being. In him, I mean, every fiber that we have is completely dependent, every little atom and molecule that makes us up is completely dependent upon the grace and mercy of God. Isn't that incredible? I mean, absolutely incredible. It's in him we live and move and have our being. Uh, you're looking at a guy who is saved to the uttermost. To the uttermost. I'm not saved by the skin of my teeth. Not at all. I'm saved to the uttermost. I mean, I am 100% born again, knowing Christ. My salvation is completely secure because it's in him. It's not dependent on me. It's dependent upon him. He's the one who made the contract. He's the one who basically signed it and said, hey, thank you very much. I got gotcha. you. I'm not God's child just for now. I am God's child for all eternity. Think that through. For all eternity. If I happen to be a child of God for all eternity, how much liberty should that take and give me in this present life? How much confidence and assurance that when I do pray, I have a heavenly father that listens. Listen, if Elon Musk, which I really like that name, it just sounds so cool. But anyway, if Elon Musk contacted you and said, hey, listen, all my wealth I'm making available to you. All you got to do is ask. Now, I know how some of you would be. You say, let's see, I could really use this. <clears throat> Man, we'd be on the phone. Hey, Elon. Yes. I got a need. Now, now think with me. Elon Musk is, I believe he's referred to as the richest man uh, in the United States, or maybe in the world right now. His goal is to be a trillionaire. <laughs> really? <laughs> my goodness, a trillionaire. <laughs> I can't even get my head wrapped around a million. Do you know what's the difference between a million and a billion? Have you ever stopped to think about it? A million seconds is equal to about 14 days. A million seconds. A billion seconds is equal to 33 years. It's a, it's a vast difference. We hear that million and billion so often we don't even realize the, the incredible difference that it is. He wants to be a trillionaire? Good Lord, that's incredible. Anyway, nothing to do with the sermon, but moving on. But if Elon Musk contacted you and said, listen, all my wealth I'm making available to you, man, you'd be a happy camper. I mean, it'd change your life. 
You'd have a new walk. I mean, you'd have a new set of assurance inside of you. You would take and probably act a, a completely different. Let me help you with something. Elon Musk is bankrupt if he doesn't know Jesus Christ as his Savior. We're the ones who are the wealthy ones. Our God is the God of the universe. I mean, he knows he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. There's not a, there's not a, a blade of grass that can take and move without his, without his taking an assurance of it, without his knowledge. Listen, nothing can happen to you apart from him. You're absolutely, think of this word, invincible until God takes you home. Amen. That's good preaching. Hallelujah. Think about it. Invincible? Move over, X-Men. You got nothing on Brother Mike right here. Listen, have some, have some satisfaction. Find your fulfillment in the fact you're in Christ. What a great place to be. I mean, there is no better. Number three, and last of all, may your faith always believe you are bankrupt without Christ. May your faith always believe that. May you believe I must be vitally and 100% constantly attached to him, always, unbroken. I want this relationship to be vibrant and alive and, and living and moving in my life, never to have any kind of interruption. <clears throat> Amen. Because notice what he says again, I'm poor and needy. I'm poor and needy. Listen, that should, be the, that should be the humility side of this grand position that we have in Jesus Christ. Man, dear God, I'm poor and needy without you. I have nothing. I've got absolutely nothing if I don't have you. Listen, <clears throat> David, it was, this little statement is a declaration of the value that David had of himself if God was not working in his life. Think about that. Dear God, if you're not working in my life, I'm just bankrupt. I've got nothing. Well, listen to this little psalm here. There's a lot in there. And I, if I can just leave you once again with verse number four, and we'll read this and then pray. It says, let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. And let such as love thy salvation say continually, let God be magnified. Let God be magnified. Let's stand to our feet, shall we? <clears throat> I'm going to pray and our brother's going to come and close us out here. Lord God, thank you. You're a good God to us. Thank you that you hear and you answer prayer. Lord God, thank you for your word. I do pray, those of us, as we know you as our Savior, I pray from our heart and, and with a, a balanced emotion of humility as well as assurance, I pray we can say, let God be magnified. May you be completely glorified, I pray, in our life. And we'll thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.